a couple of weeks ago, we analyzed problems where one object was moving towards another object, and sometimes they stuck together, sometimes they didn't, whatever. Okay. We analyzed that problem using the law of conservation of momentum. We would say uh, M1, V1, I plus, well, if object number two is at rest, it would be plus zero equals, let's assume they stick together here, equals MVF, right? We solved those problems. We did a good job with those problems. We had some practice questions. We had a quiz on that stuff. We had um, a worksheet on that stuff, and we did a good job on that. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we also looked at problems like this, where maybe number object number one was at rest, and object number two was moving towards object number one. In this case, we would say zero, because object number one is at rest, plus M2V2I. Let's change the color of that, though. And again, let's say they stick together, just for this question. MVF, the total mass times the final velocity. We know how to do this question, right? We did a good job on this one as well. We did, a couple of weeks ago, analyze X components and Y components without calling them X components and Y components. We just did one at a time because it was only one axis that the problem was on. But then last week before our break, we started dealing with problems where we had both axes in the same question. Object number one was moving to the right towards object number two, but object number two was moving upwards towards object number one. So it's kind of combined question one and two, forming our third question here. How do we analyze this? Well, we had to break it up into X components and Y components. The X component would be described by this. How can we say that there's zero momentum for object number two? Well, because it's not moving on the x-axis. It's moving, but only on the y-axis, and we're focusing on the x-axis here. So we would say that object number one has a momentum, m1, v1, i. Object number two has no momentum on the x-axis, and then the final momentum is due to both objects going off as one. All right, now we've got to do the y component, because there are two components here. All we're going to do for that is what we did for the second problem. This time we would say the momentum of object number one is zero. And why would we say that? Well, because even though it's moving, it's moving on the x-axis, not the y-axis. And we're focusing on just the y-axis here. So object number one, zero momentum. It's as if it's not even moving, because it's not on the y-axis. Object number two is moving on the y-axis, m2v2i equals mvf, the combined momentum. Now. We're going to almost certainly solve for VF X component, VF Y component, and we combine them, right? Combining using using this and this, the X component and the Y component, and then we'd solve for the hypotenuse using the Pythagorean theorem, and we'd solve for the angle using the inverse tan function. Done. Right? Done. How does this problem change, though? Notice how we've gone from this, which you guys nailed a couple weeks ago, and this, which you guys nailed a couple weeks ago, to this, which is a little bit harder because we've got to do problem one and two combined. Now we're going to that next step where we've got maybe object number one isn't going straight to the right towards object number two. Maybe object number one is going down like this towards object number two. How does that change things? Well, let's say this angle here is 30 degrees, let's say. How does that change things? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Find the X and Y for that. We don't like a funny angle, so let's get rid of it. Now, what we've done down here doesn't change, right? What we've done down, um, actually, that's not quite true. Okay, something is going to change here. We'll deal with that in a second. Let's take that funny angle off to the side here. Okay, over here, off to the side, 30 degrees. Let's say this is an X component, and this is a Y component. Solve for the X component using trigonometry. Get its value. Solve for the Y component 
using trigonometry, get its value. And then let's sub our numbers into here. We'd say M1, V1, V1i, the x component of that first velocity would be plugged in there. This one still doesn't have any x component. Now what about this one? For the y component, we'd say, oh, now we'd have to say m1 v1i because there is a y component to this first velocity now. We'd add that to m2 times v2i as it was before, and then we'd solve for the fx and the fy and use the Pythagorean theorem and the inverse tan function. The only difference between this question and the question we had up just a moment ago is the funny angle. And once, as Chase said, you get rid of the funny angle by taking it off to the side here, getting x and y components using sine and cosine, then it becomes just like that other question. All right? Is that ringing a bell? This is period two. You guys have had like an hour and a half to get back into the groove of thinking now, unless you had a spare period one. Fitness? Oh, perfect. Perfect. No better way to get your mind into things than running around and get your heartbeat going. All right. We had uh, a number of questions for homework over the break. It was uh, from worksheet number four. We had questions four to eight, four, five, six, seven, and eight. We're going to take a look at two questions from worksheet number four, questions six and seven, starting with question number six. Number six is a 200 kilogram bomb moving at a velocity of 10 meters per second to the west, exposed into three pieces. The first piece has a mass of 100, the second piece 55, and the third piece is going to go off somewhere we don't know where. Um, this one's a little bit different than question four and five because the bomb is moving before it explodes. Here's our explosion point right here. Okay, when it explodes, this 200 gram, kilogram bomb explodes. We have uh, one piece going to the west at 90 meters per second. We're going to call that piece number one, 90 meters per second, and its mass is 100 kilograms. We're going to say that the second piece goes 30 degrees north of east. Thirty degrees north of east, and it's at fifty-five meters per second, and it's fifty-five kilograms. And where's the third piece go? We don't we don't really know where the third piece goes. Um, I'm going to predict that the third piece is going to go down here somewhere, but um, it this is a tricky one because it's moving before it explodes. It's kind of tricky to predict exactly where it's going to go here. It's going to go down somewhere, down to the left, down to the right. We're not really sure. We do know the mass of the third piece is 45 kilograms. It's 200 minus 100 minus 55, and we want to find out how fast it's moving. Now, let me write in something here, okay? I'm going to write in that the initial velocity is... 10 meters per second to the west. Just to remind me of that, okay? I have a hard time drawing that in just because it makes the diagram look really confusing if I draw it in. But I want to put that in so that I don't forget that it does have an initial velocity. All right. We got a funny angle. Take it off over here and get rid of that funny angle. That's always what we do, right? 30 degrees right here. Um, this is 55 meters per second. Let's call this X. Let's call this Y. Say cosine 30 degrees is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. The X component works out to be 47.6314 meters per second. And we're going to say sine 30 degrees is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. That's 27.5 meters per second. Square that off. I like to block it off just to separate it from the rest of the question. Really just to show you that this is what makes this question different than any other two-dimensional problem. Right? It's the funny angle, getting rid of that funny angle. So now what I like to do, and some of you some of you do this as well, some of you don't, whatever. But what I like to do is actually erase 
that second vector there and replace it with this and this. Replace it with a 47.6314 and replace it with a 27.5 meters per second. Now, I don't even have that 55 meters per second anymore, right? It's gone. It's dead to us. Once we've replaced the funny angle with the X and the Y, we're never going to look at that 55 meters per second again. Right? The 47 to the east and the 27 to the north is exactly the same thing as saying 55 at 30 degrees. It's just an easier way of dealing with it, that's all. All right? We get the third vector, which is at a funny angle as well, but that's okay because we're trying to find that one. All right, let's, uh, let's go X and Y here. Let's say PI equals PF. Now, normally in an explosion, the initial momentum will be what? Zero. This time it's not because the bomb because the bomb is moving. So we're going to say the initial momentum is MVI, the total mass times VI, equals M1V1F plus M2V2F plus M3V3F, all three objects here. Total mass was 200. The initial velocity was negative 10. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Oh, what have I done wrong here? Sorry, say it again. This is zero. How come it's zero? How come the initial momentum is zero? It's moving at 10 meters per second. No, it's not. I was right the first time. Yeah, it's zero on the y-axis, right? It should be what I said the first time, 20 times, sorry, 200 times negative 10. It's moving to the left. It's moving to the west at 10 meters per second before the explosion takes place. M1 is 100 times negative 90 because it's to the west. M2 was 55 kilograms times positive 47 point, I'm going to do that in green here, 47.6314, because remember I'm, re I'm not using that 55 meters per second, it's gone to us, it's head to us. We're just using the X component of that 55. plus M3, which is 45 kilograms, times V3F. Does that make sense to us? So dealing with the X component here is exactly the same as if, pretend for a second, pretend for a second, that wasn't there. Pretend it was just on the x-axis. Okay, that's what it would look like, right? Okay, it, it's not just on the x-axis. It's on the x and the y-axis. But as far as we're concerned right now with what we just did, there is no y-axis. I'm only looking at one at a time. Okay, we do the math here. Solve for V3F. If you have trouble getting this value on your calculators, let me know and I can help you out with that. V3F works out to be 97.3394. So the X component of this, positive 97.3394. We guessed right. We thought that it would go to the right and down. Sure enough, it goes to the right. Positive 97. And then we deal with the Y, the y component. So it was... Initially, before the explosion took place, moving to the west, how much of that is on the y-axis? Space? Zero. So we're just going to say 
the initial momentum for the y component is zero plus m1 v1 f plus m2 v2 f plus m3 v3 f. Object number one afterwards is only on the x-axis. Look, it's moving at 90 meters per second, but none of that 90 is up or down. That 90 is all x. So let's make it zero for the y component, that is. Let's make it zero. M2 is 55. The y component of that is 27.5. And we figured it out. We don't need to do anything here other than write down a number, write down a number that we have written down already. And then M3 is 45 kilograms times V3F. Let's solve for V3F. And it works out to be negative 33.611. I'm going to replace this with, with green, actually, just to remind us that this is the number that, that we replaced or that we found when we did our components there. Yeah, yeah. You good there? All right, now, now comes the easy part. Now all we got to do is this. Uh, our x component is 97. 0.3394. Our y component is 33 downwards. So we're going to say 33.6111 downwards. And then we're going to find we're going to find v by using the Pythagorean theorem. And when we do, it works out to be 103 meters per second. And we're going to solve for theta. Theta works out to be 19.0 degrees south of east. He's in the inverse tan of opposite over adjacent. All right, let's take a look at number seven, the last one that we want to do here. It says a stationary 300-gram puck is struck by a 200-gram puck moving two meters per second to the west. After the collision, uh, we get a velocity of one meters per second, 53 degrees north of west. What's the velocity of the 300-gram puck after the collision? All right, uh, I want to say object number one here is my 300 gram object 0 0.300 kilograms it's uh, at rest so zero meters per second i'm going to say object number two is moving towards it it has a mass of 0 0.200 kilograms and has a velocity of two meters per second they collide and it says the 200 gram puck that's the lighter one object number two as we named it goes off this way at 53 degrees at a speed of 1.00 meters per second, and then object number one is presumably going to go down this way. Uh, we don't know how fast it goes. That's what we're going to try to find. Five words. Five words. Rachel, what's the first word? Emma, what's the second word? Okay, what's the third word? What's the third word, Logan? What's the fourth word? Okay. Funny, and the fifth word? I don't like funny angles. Good. I don't like funny angles. We have one here. It's 53 degrees. Let's get rid of it. Over here. Let's call this our Y component, and let's call this our X component. Okay, we find the X and the Y using trig. Uh, I'm going to not actually write down this step, the cosine and sine function. If you have trouble with that, let me know and I can help you. Just raise your hand if you're if you're not sure where this comes from. Right, cosine 53 is equal to x over 1. x works out to be 0 0.6018. And the y component, that's the opposite side of the triangle. So we're going to say sine 53 is y over 1. Uh, y ends up being 0 0.7986 meters per second. Let's block that off to keep it separate. Yep. Yep, go ahead. All right, now let's uh, 
now let's let's replace this. Let's redraw this over here. Object number two is still there, but it's going off this way. X component 0 0.6018, and it's going off this way. Y component 0.7986. All right. Now let's say X components, Y components. Let's say uh, PI equals PF. Say M1. Uh, actually, M1 V1I is zero, right? Because object number one's at rest. Plus M2 V2I equals M1 V1F plus M2 V2F. And then we, what do we got here? Oh, man, I thought they were the same masses there for a second. 300 and 200, not quite. So we got to include those. We got... Uh, what do we got here? Um, 0 0.200 times negative 2. M1 is 0 0.300 times V1F plus 0 0.200 times V2F, which is negative 0 0.6018. And we don't have the one meter per second anymore. It's gone. We replaced it with 0 0.6018 and 0 0.7986. Solve for V1F. When we do, it works out to be, what does it work out to be? Um, negative 0.93213. Good there? What's next? Y component, right? Kind of running out of space here, but let's say for the Y component, I'll try to do it really small here so I have enough space here. For the Y component, we'll say uh, PI equals PF. The initial momentum for the Y component is zero because although object number two is moving, it's moving on the X axis, not the Y axis equals M1 V1F plus M2 V2F. We got uh, 0 0.300 0 times V1F plus 0 0.200 0 times V2F was, what was it, 0 0.7986. It's positive because it's upwards. Solve for V1F here. It works out to be negative 0.5324. What do we do with these now? Easy, easy part now, right? Physics 20 part now. It's, this is like three weeks into physics 20 here. We got an X component that's 0 0.93213. And a Y component that's 0.5324. And we solve for V. And we solve for theta there as well using the inverse tan function. Okay, we're done those. Let's take a look at our practice questions that we had to do for today. And then uh, we'll take a little bit of a break and then we'll do some new stuff here, okay? Finish off the unit. Practice question set number five, which is our concept 16. Our first question, good question to start off with. I love this question. Really like this question, actually. Um, listen very carefully to what I say about this, because what I say about this is directly relevant to one of the questions on your test on Thursday. Okay? Okay, what I'm going to say about this question is very important to one of the questions on your test on Thursday. This question says we got a coal mine and train engine bumps an empty hopper car. The hopper car moves off and at a speed of 2 meters per second, moving to the right at a speed of 2 meters per second. And it triggers a switch so that coal falls down towards it like this. So we've got a collision, right? Hopper car is moving to the right. The coal is moving downwards. What happens? The hopper car collects the coal. They head off as one, right? It's a two-dimensional collision. Where 
should theoretically the hopper car and the coal go? Now, I don't want you to answer this question like, oh, intuitively I know it's going to go this way. Where should it theoretically go? Okay. Yeah, diagonal down, down and to the right. Now, realistically, we know that it's going to go to the right. right? Like when something hits a, car, a train, the train keeps going horizontally, right? It doesn't go down into the earth. We'll deal with that in a second, okay? Okay, right now we're going to write down what we theoretically know it should do. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and, and, um, be careful with that because even if it pushes back with an equal force, that doesn't mean it's not going to go through it, right? But but we'll deal with that in a second, okay? All right, so what do we got here? We got an X and a Y problem, right? A, a, a two-dimensional problem, a T-bone collision problem. So let's so let's do that. Let's do X component first. Let's say the X component is what? PI equals PF. Let's say it's M1 V1I plus zero, the coal, has zero momentum on the x-axis, this is all on the y-axis, equals mvf, the combined mass times vf. m1 is uh, 1.00 times 10 to the 4 times v1i, which is 2 meters per second. The combined mass is 2.2 times 10 to the 4, that's the coal and the hopper car combined, times vf, and we solve for vf. And we do, it works out to be 0 0.909 meters per second. So far, so good? Now, this is what I want you to pay particular attention to, what I'm about to say right now. This is what's directly relevant to one of the questions in your test on Thursday. When you are doing a question where the Earth becomes part of the problem, and don't bother dealing with the Y component. What do I mean by that? A problem where the Earth becomes part of the problem? When this coal hits the, the hopper car, it pushes everything downwards, right? We have a downward momentum. But because the Earth is below it, the Earth has to go downwards as well. Does that make sense? Like the, vertically, the Earth and the hopper car are one thing, right? So if it pushes the hopper car down, it has to push the Earth down as well. Does it? Yes. But if you analyze the Y component, if you analyze the Y component, look at what you'd get. We have zero momentum for the, the, the hopper car plus, uh, what would it be? Um, 1.2 times 10 to the 4 times VI, whatever that is. We don't even know how fast that's moving vertically, right? But let's assume that we did for a second. Equals the combined mass times VF. If you solve for VF there for the Y component, you, I don't even know exactly what you get, but it would be 0 0.000 so on. Actually, this number is wrong. Not 2.2 times 10 to the 4, because we'd have to include the mass of the Earth there. Right? The Earth becomes part of the system. And that's why this number becomes so ridiculously small. There's a, an X component of 0 0.9, a Y component of 0 0.000000000000, and so on. When we combine those, what do you end up getting? 0 0.909. That's why I'm saying when the Earth becomes part of the problem, and it does here because the coal is going down and pushing the coal car and the Earth with it, when the Earth becomes part of the problem, don't even bother with the Y component. If you do, you're going to find that its value is so small that it just doesn't matter. And it moves the Earth. But how much? Realistically, an immeasurable amount. Yeah, you couldn't actually solve for the Y component in this question because you don't know what the initial speed of the coal is before the collision. But assuming you did, you could, but it would be ridiculously small. So just don't do it. Just don't do it, okay? Got it? When a problem involves the, is, is involving the Earth as well, when the Earth becomes part of the problem, just ignore the Y component. So that means the, the whole, total velocity afterwards is 0 0.909. Now we have to express that in scientific notation. 9.09 .09 times 10 to the negative 1. How do we write that in? Some of you did this. Some of you just wrote in 9. Okay, on a diploma exam, that would actually be marked wrong. B is not one digit. B is a three-digit answer. 
There's no reason why B can't be 9.09. .09. B doesn't mean one digit. B means a number. They tell you right below how many digits to make it. Second question on that uh, practice question set, number five. Uh, multiple choice question number one. We've got curling rocks here striking each other, going off at a couple funny angles. Uh, good news here is the curling rocks all weigh the same. They better at least. Okay, if the red curling rock happens to be heavier than the blue one, then I want to be red. Okay, but pretty sure that you're going to find the curling rocks all have the same mass. Um, Two-dimensional collision here because we've got a funny angle. we got to deal with this one off to the side over here. Hey, okay, let's call this X, call this Y. And we can solve for X by this point, right? X is 0 0.0547 using trigonometry. And Y is 0.1289 using trigonometry. So let's replace it with this. Right. X component. Let's say M1 V1I plus zero, because the blue curling rock is at rest, equals M1 V1F plus M2 V2F. Mass is canceled. That's good news, because it saves us some a little bit of calculation. V1I is 0.36. V1F is 0 0.0547. We solve for V2F. Gives us 0 0.3053 meters per second. And the next step, Y component, right? You can do the Y component. There's a shortcut here, though. Anybody spot the shortcut? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, good. We already, we already know that this is 23 degrees. You've just found the X component to be 0 0.3053. All we got to do here is use some trigonometry now. Say a cosine... 23 degrees is equal to adjacent over that pot is solve for V and it works out to be 0 0.33. What if you don't spot that shortcut? What can you do? Just, just do all the work like we did in all the other questions, right? Solve for the Y component. Once you get the y, com the x component and the y component, do the Pythagorean theorem and solve for v. Listen, that shortcut's probably going to save you two minutes. That's great. But listen carefully. Sometimes you're going to come across shortcuts like this on tests. Don't spend five minutes looking for a shortcut that's going to save you two. If you spot the shortcut right away, great, take it. If you don't, whatever. Just do it the, do it the normal way, okay? Okay, we got one more question, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, multiple choice number two on practice question set number five. A hole is drilled into a boulder that has a mass of 250 kilograms. An explosive charge is placed on the hole. The boulder explodes into three pieces. They fly off at right angles to each other. Okay, yeah, right angles to each other, but what, where? Like left, right, up, down? It doesn't matter because we're looking for the magnitude of the momentum. Good. So let's just, let's just let's pick directions. Let's say that... Uh, object number one, let's say, is uh, going off, it, we'll call it 50 kilograms, and it's got a, a velocity of 10 meters per second. Object number two, let's say, is going this way. It's got 110 kilograms, going off at 4 meters per second. We could say that object number three is going to go off this way, right? Uh, its mass, object number three's mass, is going to be 90 kilograms. We're looking for its final momentum. Could we have picked different directions? Sure, we could have. If we were looking for a direction of the final momentum, then, then it would matter which way these are going. But a magnitude? 
it doesn't matter. If they're at right angles, good enough. Okay. X component. Zero initial momentum equals 50, uh, sorry, object number one also has zero on the x-axis plus 110 times 4, the x component of the second one, plus 90 times V3F. And V3F works out to be 4.888. The y component, we're going to say zero initial momentum equals 50 times one, uh, 10 plus zero, because object number two is the only x, plus 90 times V3F. And that works out to be negative 0. Point, uh, sorry, negative 5.5555. And when you combine those, Hey, when you combine those, uh, sorry, that was negative 4.88. Combine those, 4.888, 5.556. Combine those, what do we get? 7.40037. Look, that's that makes the answer A, right? Oh, man, this is a question on last semester's unit test, eh? And lots of people put A for this, and it's wrong. Nick, what's wrong with it? Oh, you need to go to the grab pictures, right? Okay. Kenway, what's wrong with it? Yeah, we just talked for the speed, the magnitude of the velocity. We need the momentum. How do we find the momentum? So the mass is 90. The velocity is, or the magnitude of the velocity is 7.40037. How many people said 7.4 for that one? Okay, one person raised their hand. That's a that's a lie. I know lots of you said that. Okay, that's there's a there's a there's a moral to that lesson, right? Or moral to this story is make sure you know what you're being asked for. Make sure you know what you're being asked for. The answer, by the way, works out to be, and this is why you'll see in a second why if you've made a mistake on this why you made a mistake. Okay, when you multiply those together, we get six 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 kilograms meters per second. I'll tell you why you got it wrong, because the devil made you do it. 